So let's be comfortable. Upright, if possible, if you need the support of a cushion behind you, that's, uh, that's good, that's fine. And <clears throat> with this sense of being upright, the, let there also be a sense of being relaxed. That's really important. Uh, not the relaxation of uh, preparing to sleep, but a sense of being at ease. Uh, you should feel that you are in a uh, comfortable, quiet, and um, friendly place where there's no threat, a sense of uh, yeah, a community of people working towards similar positive goals. So there can be a sense of being at ease. But also we can, at the outset, <clears throat> be awake and alert. The Buddha in his Dhammapada, or rather in compilation of the teachings, uh, in the Dhammapada, a very famous basic well-loved text, there's a verse which, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it, where he says, um, awareness, awareness is the heart of light, the dharma, and uh, unawareness is the part of death, of spiritual death, one might say. So there's that sense that we're not going to just allow our mind to do whatever it wants to do, but we're going to watch carefully, but with a sense of being relaxed, not in a tense way. And if we can, we can um, keep the body as still as possible. That would be good. Not easy, but we can try. Usually we move quite a bit, we fidget. So here let's experiment with just keeping the body still. So arms relaxed by the side of the body, gap between the torso and the arms. Hands can be on your knees, thighs, or in the lap meditation posture. The arm, the legs, make sure they are comfortably crossed or in a position where they're not feeling constricted or painful. Let the head be tilted slightly forwards, downwards, so the back of the neck slightly elongated and the head tilted slightly downwards. This will help to relieve tension in the neck. And at our stage, it may help to make one feel a bit calmer. Be aware of what's happening in the muscles of the face. Let there be a sense of relaxation around the mouth, around the eyes. Shoulders level, not pulled back, but also not hunched forwards. Eyes can be slightly open if it's possible for you to let in some light, but if that's tricky, you can close them. But do be careful not to uh, become sleepy. Let's 
So here there's a sense of tremendous. Well, one word that we use is uh, for stability, but also dignity. You know, there's a tremendous dignity when we can be calm and still and not fidgeting and rushing around. So there's a sense of dignity, a sense of uprightness, which can be very useful indeed, physically as well as psychologically. And in this posture, the front of the body, you see, is open because we're sitting upright and we're not hunching. So the front of the body is open and that is also very significant. It's as though we are presenting a very straightforward, open, sort of uh, aspect to the world. We are not closed down, we are open, straightforward. We're not trying to hide. And that is, can be quite scary because we may be conditioned to hide in some way, hide our feelings, hide our <clears throat> hide ourselves, hide ourselves from ourselves as well as from others. So here there's a sense of uh, openness. At least we are pretending maybe in the beginning with the posture. A sense of uh, even you could say courage fearlessness in this open open posture and it needs to be this way we could say because we not only have a responsibility for ourselves to be upright, dignified, calm, relaxed, and aware. But we also have, you see, don't we, this responsibility to the world, to other people, and to the plants and the trees and animals, the human beings. We have a responsibility to them. So this open-hearted attitude uh, reminds us of that because it's possible sometimes to forget it. I think we've all had that experience where we can forget our connection to others. You know, sometimes when we are very upset or caught up in our own little or big problem issue, we can totally forget other people and how much they also need happiness, just like oneself. How they also suffer. Have tremendous problems. And also, of course, how, as we keep on reminding ourselves, how they have been so kind, so kind to me, so kind to us. We may not feel this way if someone today or in the recent past has upset us or abused us in some way or is cheating us. But if you think of the other situations where everything we have, including our body, you see, depends upon other people, if we think that way, then we realize that to really, it is staggering. It is unbelievable how much we owe to other people. It's almost as though it cannot, that kindness cannot be repaid to use unfortunate commercial sounding words. But you know, how to respond to all this kindness? We couldn't get here to Kushita without certain forms of transport, roads, and so forth. 
or without having food in your stomach for days on end, you wouldn't you wouldn't be here. You would be struggling to find food somewhere. Unconscious. So everything we have, you see, and use is coming through the efforts upon the tremendous efforts of other people. And sometimes, of course, even the lives, lives of animals uh, to feed this uh, body of ours. So you see, this posture uh, reminds us of these things. And that we're going to be a dignified, or could be a dignified, open-hearted person who's not afraid to work with the world, help the world, as we also help ourselves. So just spend a little while getting comfortable with the posture, getting used to the posture, having a sense of its implications that I've mentioned. And we could spend some time reflecting on that. And this would be what we call a kind of contemplative, analytical meditation. It's also meditation because we're getting used to something which is worthwhile beneficial. So to be of any real use, benefit for ourselves and others, we need to obviously have a stable, healthy body and mind, especially a healthy mind. So for that, again and again, the teachings remind us that we need to first have a basic stability in the mind, certain basic level of attentiveness and calm, so that the mind is not just flying all over the place, as it often does, creating a lot of mischief, a lot of pain, anxiety, and so forth. So we'll begin by very calmly but attentively being aware of the normal breathing by focusing our attention on the tip of the nostrils and being aware of the sensation of the breath at that point. It may take a little while to pick up the sensation. So you can take a few deep breaths initially, so that you can bring your attention to that spot between the upper lip and the nostrils. Just paying attention in a calm way to that sensation of the breath. And you can 
utilize the out breath to sense, to feel a sense of uh, relaxation and letting go. Thoughts, of course, will arise, that is natural. So what we do, well, the advice here is to simply be aware that thought has arisen, recognize, gently let it go. Don't start following the thought process, however interesting it may be. Just let it go and come back to the breath. It's easier said than done, but we can still make some calm effort in this direction. So thought comes, recognize calmly, not with any kind of impatience, very calmly. And just let it go, come back to the breath. Okay, so then we can, <clears throat> before we start the actual the talking part of the session, we can remember what we call the motivation. We have already, of course, implicitly, uh, indirectly brought up the motivation when we mentioned the dignity and especially the openness to others. But let us remember again the utmost need for loving kindness and a sense of compassion, a sense of being sensitive enough to recognize the problems, the pain of living in, in the world, in samsara, and how this affects everybody, from the smallest insect to the to humans, to the largest whale in the ocean, how all these beings are wanting happiness. What, however they term it, they want some kind of satisfaction, do they not? Some kind of freedom from fear and so forth, fear, any kind of pain. So remember, that it's within our power as a single human being to bring tremendous pain to others, but also tremendous happiness. Even one person can bring a lot of calm and comfort and satisfaction to others. Not ultimately, obviously, because 
each person has to work for their own happiness and liberation. But a kind, wise, attentive person can do a lot to bring comfort and happiness and create the conditions for other people to blossom, to flourish, to uh, become more and more aware, and so forth. As the Buddha himself said, you know, he's not, he's a Marg Darshak, he shows the path. He cannot install us deeply in the path. He cannot force us to understand and practice the implications of, you know, all of the main topics, death and impermanence, precious human life, karma, suffering. The Buddha can't make us understand these things at a deep level. He can only guide us with the words. And if we're lucky, we may have hello students or teachers who actually provide good examples so that we do get some living proof that uh, the path is something real. Yes. <clears throat> hmm. So anyway, we remember the motivation. And traditionally, we are taught that um, we should approach any kind of teaching with the attitude that oneself, I myself, am a sick person. Uh, the teachings are medicine. Uh, the person delivering the teaching is like a doctor, representing the doctor, especially the great Lord Buddha, the greatest doctor. <clears throat> and that we should have the conviction that the medicine, the dharma, does have the ability to completely heal us of our dukkha, our suffering, our neurosis. And it can do that for a very good reason, just as, say, let's say, a, a young person with a relatively healthy body, if they're sick, the medicine the doctor, a good doctor gives can work because basically that young person with a healthy body is healthy. So the medicine can restore you to health. We are not primarily or fundamentally sick, you could say, in the body. If we are fundamentally sick, then no medicine could change that situation, but that's not the case. So similarly with the mind, it is said, Buddha says, and our teachers teach us this, that we all have this fundamental goodness, basic goodness within us. Everybody has. We sometimes call it Buddha nature. The Bhagat, the Garb. So since we have that basic purity, that basic goodness, right? The fact that you and I may be suffering now from many kinds of problems, emotional, physical, mental, all kinds, that is not to be taken as something permanent or fundamental. It is a temporary, you understand, temporary situation. Temporary situation. However, you know, much you think you are abiding in some kind of horrible, hellish mental space right now, uh, that is temporary, according to Lord Buddha, because fundamentally we are pure. Fundamentally, there is goodness. Goodness is not as good against bad, but just fundamental purity. Hmm. So this is the excellent good news in Buddhism, which we must always remember, especially when we are feeling downhearted, a little bit unhappy, depressed, sad, uh, panicky. All these things are like waves on the surface of the vast ocean. Deep down, it's very calm and clear. 
So this is important to remember. Okay. So I want to briefly uh, recap, very briefly, what we're looking at on Tuesday, simply by reading something. Mm. And actually I'm reading from a book which very kindly sent to me by our good friend, uh, Sujit Prasad. Um, he's here with us. And he uh, has written something at the beginning, which is very important, and before I quote from the actual book itself. And we must always keep this in mind. And we'll talk a little bit about this later as well. What he has written in the front of the book to me is um, maybe all words are an attempt to carry us to a space beyond words. Yeah, all words, maybe all words are an attempt to carry us to a space beyond words. You understand? The word is not the actual thing, is it? When we say moon or sun or banana or love, anything, the word is not the thing. If you write the word love 100 meters high, it won't do us much good except perhaps get in people's way. You can, you know, have a the word banana 100 meters high, but you can't eat it. You can't be nourished by it. So words can be very tricky. We must remember this. However, what does the Buddha use? He uses words. A very extraordinary word, I have to say. Well, extraordinary in English, it's said to be even more extraordinary in Sanskrit or Tibetan. The meaning comes out clearer in those languages, apparently. But even in English, uh, the, we have all been inspired in our own language, right? Whether it is Hindi or English or whatever, by words. But they only can take us so far, perhaps. Right? They are pointing towards something. The Japanese Buddhists, the Zen Buddhists, speak of uh, a finger pointing at the moon. So words are a little bit like that. The finger pointing at something. It's not the actual thing itself. So I'm, I'm going to uh, read something from the, this book that was sent to me. And it's one of my favorite authors, favorite um, wise people whom I had the privilege to also listen to live three or four times back in the 80s, um, Krishnamurti. And he kind of sums up, in a sense, what we were partly looking at last uh, day before yesterday, when we're talking about the crisis we are in. So listen to this, and then I'll be quiet for a minute or two while you just digest a little bit what has been said and then we'll then i'll talk about it a bit and then we'll go on to some of the other main points i want to look at today so just to give you some background krishnamurti for those who don't know he was born in 1895 in andhra pradesh and was discovered in a sense by some unusual people uh, and was groomed to be a world leader kind of messiah world spiritual leader, uh, an organization also connected with that. But in his early 30s, he decided to give that up and he made the famous statement that the truth, truth is a pathless land. You cannot actually find an actual path that leads to the truth. The truth is something very extraordinary and cannot be gained through any very deliberate method of using uh, a lot of ambition and so forth. I won't get into that bit too much. But anyway, and his point was, he said, I want to make man, I want to set man unconditionally free, free without any conditions. And he was somebody who admitted that he had read very little in, the, in terms of world literature, spiritual books, and he based what he 
spoke of on his own experience, especially paying tremendous attention to himself and to the world. He was the sort of person who, and this is quite interesting, he could go on a walk. He used to go for walks. And on one of the walks near his school in uh, Rajgarh, Varanasi, he told the Western photographer, I think, who was with him, that, you know, during my morning walks, I don't have a single thought. <laughs> this is interesting. He's simply aware of what's happening, but no need to think. Why think? Because thinking is words in the head, right? Uh, so he'd gone, gone beyond the need to having thoughts all the time. So it doesn't mean he couldn't think doesn't mean he's saying we should cut all our thinking out. We wouldn't survive without thinking, but we don't need it all the time. And perhaps we could experiment and see what happens when the thoughts become less. Anyway, that's a big introduction. Sorry. These are the quotations I wanted to share with you from this book called Beyond Violence by teachings talks and discussions from Krishnamurti. So as I say, I'll read it and then stop so you can reflect and you may violently disagree with it. You may, um, anyway, see what you make of it. There are two quotations. We have built a society which is violent and we as human beings are violent the environment, the culture in which we live, is the product of our endeavor, of our struggle, of our pain, of our appalling brutalities. So the most important question is, is it possible to end this tremendous violence in oneself? In the second quote, we are violent. Throughout existence, human beings have been violent and are violent. I want to find out, as a human being, how to transcend this violence, how to go beyond it. What am I to do? I see what violence has done in the world how it has destroyed every form of relationship, how it has brought deep agony in oneself, misery, I see all that. And I say to myself, I want to live a really peaceful life in which there is a deep abundance of love. All the violence must go. Now, what have I to do? If we had more time, we would sit silently longer. But uh, I would invite you to keep the kind of flavor of these quotes in your mind. And they can act as a kind of yeast. And you can reflect on this. By violence, Krishnamurti doesn't just mean physical violence or verbal violence. That's obvious. But the violence we do to ourselves by not be authentic to ourselves, by constantly mistrusting ourselves, 
the kind of civil war that, that goes on in our minds, you know, should I do this, should I do that, the, you know, all that. Yeah, it's like a civil war in the mind, you know. So that is violence. Not to to deceive oneself is a kind of violence, to deceive others, not to be honest, not to have a sense of integrity, to be hypocritical. It's all a kind of violence against the truth. So there's all these forms of violence. And the worst, and you know, the most obvious form is war between countries. Um, there's violence everywhere. Uh, we can check, we can check this violence. There's violence. Well, anyway, check. It's a form of violence to smile at someone and pretend to be friendly when you have some uh, ulterior motive, or you might even want to trick them or harm them. That is violence. That smile is violence. So it's not necessarily violence. If with a kind motivation, you quite harshly or strongly bring somebody you know, under control so that they don't harm you or other people, that could be done with a loving mind. That would not be violent, even though it may appear violent. So we have to understand what we mean by violence. <clears throat> Krishnamurti wasn't afraid to tell the students at his school in Rishi Valley, in South India, a school that's been there for many years. He wasn't afraid to tell the children, uh, you know, soon he would tell them, you're going to go out into this rotten society. <laughs> you know, we might be telling students that. Uh, it's not a very nice thing to say in one way, but maybe it's more truthful than saying you're going out into this wonderful, you know, Amrit Khan, or whatever it's supposed to be we're in now. Uh, Achedin, um, where you know, etc. So we have to be prepared for the fact that there's a tremendous amount of insensitivity, of violence, of hatred. We see, we see so much. So, yeah, that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> the other problem we have, well, there are many. <laughs> and it's first time coming, I'll be moving from the more social, environmental, uh, structural to something which is more connected with the Buddha Dharma as such. But it's very important to have context because when we practice, we're not just practicing in this little room in Uttashita. We're living in a world. We're connected with other people. And in an hour's time, we go out into the big bad world, you know, or whatever. And we have to exist in that. Preferably in a way that has some benefit for the people. And isn't just a kind of selfish um, struggle for survival. Listen to this when it's what I find extraordinary um, author, social scientist, philosopher, um, who was writing in the 50s and 60s. Um, and this may not be new to you, but anyway, listen carefully. And again, you don't have to agree. I'm putting this out so that we can think about it. And, not forget. And the fact that this was written in 1957, it's pretty amazing. Amazing in the sense these issues, these structural problems, the structural violence has been around a long time, not just something the last 30, 40, 50 years. Modern capitalism needs men who cooperate smoothly and in large numbers, who want to consume more and more, 
and whose tastes are standardized and can be easily influenced and anticipated. It needs men who feel free and independent, not subject to any authority or principle or conscience, but yet willing to be commanded to do what is expected of them, to fit into the social machine without friction, who can be guided without force, led without leaders, prompted without aim, except the one to make good, to be on the move, to function, to go ahead. But what is the outcome? Modern man is alienated from himself, from his fellow men, and from nature. This seems quite clear. The way we treat each other, the way we treat nature, it's obvious that we are not connected in any meaningful way with these with these uh, factors anymore. He has been transformed into a commodity, experiences his life forces as an investment which must bring him the maximum profit obtainable under existing market conditions. Human relations are essentially those of alienated automatons, each basing his security on staying close to the herd not being different in thought, feeling, or action. While everybody tries to be as close as possible to the rest, everybody remains utterly alone, pervaded by the deep sense of insecurity, anxiety, and guilt, which always results when human separateness cannot be overcome. Our civilization offers many palliatives which help people to be consciously unaware, unaware of this aloneness. First of all, the strict routine of bureaucratized mechanical work, which helps people to remain unaware of their most fundamental human desires, of the longing for transcendence and unity. And so far as routine alone doesn't succeed in this, Man overcomes his unconscious despair by the routine of amusement, the passive consumption of sounds and sights offered by the amusement industry. Furthermore, by the satisfaction of buying ever new things and exchanging them for others and soon exchanging them for others. Modern man is actually quite close to the picture Huxley describes in his Brave New World which is from the 30s, I think 1938 or 39. Well fed, well clad, satisfied sexually, yet without self, without any except the most superficial contact with his fellow men. And in this book, which is called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm, he says that. Uh, Basically, it's only true, he doesn't say true, he doesn't use the word true. It's only authentic love which can really help people in this world. And that has to be free, it has to be open, it has to be responsible and caring love. Or loving kindness, the Buddha spoke of loving kindness. But this also has to come from a sense of being authentic oneself. Someone who feels very empty or guilty, deeply unhappy themselves, cannot obviously love another in the sense that is being spoken of here. So we have to work on ourselves, which is basically also what Lord Buddha is saying. We start with ourselves. We start with understanding ourselves, making friends with ourselves. There's all these practices in basic Buddhism, mindfulness of breath, mindfulness of, of um, body, mindfulness of sensations, mindfulness of feelings, yeah? mindfulness of the mind, mindfulness of phenomena. What is all this? This is all a process of getting to know ourselves better, understanding ourselves, making friends with ourselves. 
then we can offer something to the world. We can offer something to other people. Otherwise, what can we offer? We offer our emptiness, our clingingness, so I need you, tere bina kya jina, blah, blah, blah. That might sound good or feel, someone might be very, uh, what's the word? Feel very happy that you say to them, oh, I can't live without you. But um, actually what it means is that uh, someone is going to be clinging to you for quite a while and that might not be very nice later. And it's certainly not helping two people to become healthy, mature, authentic human beings. So we have to uh, work on ourselves so that there is something worthwhile we can offer to other people. Not just a shell, not just a clingy, insecure, uh, anxious human being, right? So how are we coping with this situation? I don't think we're coping very well at all. Um, and I had mentioned last week, no? Uh, not last week, day before yesterday, how I wanted to quote some of the things that are being put out on especially uh, WhatsApp groups that are supposed to uh, be nurturing our, our, uh, our wisdom, I guess. And I'm, of course, I'm a member of these groups, so you can say, why are you in this group if you're about to make fun of it? Not really making fun of it. And I'm not saying that anything that is going to be said in these quotes is absolutely wrong, but it's the way and the kind of what I'm going to call the superficiality of a lot of it that is something which I don't think is very useful. It's symptomatic of our modern quest for a quick fix. So here we have a very lovely image of a lion, right? A lion, very beautiful. And underneath it, in big letters, tomorrow won't be different if you don't change something today. Very good. Very good. No? Tomorrow won't be different if you don't change something today. Take Okay. Then somebody says, very true. Then somebody uh, says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. We'll be there, you know. Pranam bhi karenge. Apne hirde bhi lagayenge us pe. You know. Then the next one, this is great. Best exercise is walking. Hmm? Walk away from arguments that lead to anger. Very good. Walk away from thoughts that steal your happiness. The more you walk away from things that destroy your soul, the happier your life will be. Good morning. <laughs> this is a good morning message to wake us up. If coffee is not enough. And it has, of course, a picture of what looks like someone walking down a runway. It's not even a nice country road. It looks like a runway. Definitely a runway. Yeah. And, of course, it's only got one love, one heart emoticon. But someone else has given a thumbs up later. And someone says, thank you so much. So true. Thank you for sharing such a thoughtful message. Another one person says, a beautiful message. And then, of course, sorry, ladies, I'm going to Dehradun tomorrow morning, so won't be here for meditation. It's <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, enjoy your trip, blah, blah, blah. So you see, that is there. Let me quote from another group. Yeah, I'm a member of many of such wonderful groups. I'm not saying I am free from this uh, habit. Of course, some of this group, this other group I'm going to quote from, they have long messages. I'm not going to read that. They have long, long things from every the spectrum, all the spectrum. You have to be a real genius to understand some of these things, or you have to be a Christian, Hindu, <laughs> Buddhist, Sufi, uh, everything, you know, to understand this uh, masala. This is really a dharma masala. It's amazing. But I'm, okay, there's a lovely little picture, very brown, beautiful brown. So I, I love brown. 
and yeah, lovely browns of this young girl, maybe seven, eight years old, with a cute little dog in her hand, right? <clears throat> there is only one happiness in life, to love and to be loved. Good morning. A child, it's not wrong. But yeah, then you just get back to, you know, whatever you're doing. 7.14, pay a year, or thumbs up, dean Allah. Uske do dhai ghante baad ye aaya. One of the happiest moments in life is when you find the courage to let go of what you can't change. Thumbs up, Nila. So you see, this is what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. And one after another, day after day, in these different groups. And what's the result? So now let me tell you what our tradition says, what this gentleman here says. On my left, in the middle, is Lama Tsongkhapa. He was a very, very great sage. Sorry, those online, you cannot see Lama Tsongkhapa. You can see Maitreya behind me. This is Lama Tsongkhapa, okay? There are three statues there. The slightly bigger one in the middle is with his main disciples on either, on either side. He was a uh, 14th, early 15th century great saint scholar, meditator, teacher, author, who is the founder of the Yellow Hat School of Tibetan Buddhism, to which we nominally belong. And he says in his very great work, the Lamrim Chenmo, or great treatise on the path to enlightenment, he says this in the early stages of that work, or the chapter on meditation. He says, up to now, he says it beautifully, very simply, it's a very complex chapter, but th this particular uh, line, I'm only slightly paraphrasing it, is very beautifully simple. He says, up to now, we have been controlled by our mind. And now it's time for us to control our mind. Up to now, we've been under the control of our mind. That's why we're suffering. You know, He's talking about why we have problems. Up to now, we've been under the control of our mind. Now it's time to bring our mind under control. Yeah. So up to now, the mind has been you know, doing whatever it wants, getting distracted left, right, and center, joining you know, so many WhatsApp groups and giving and receiving messages, having all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of ambitions, all kinds of hopes and fears, all kinds of uh, thoughts connected with aggression, with jealousy, with the lust, with the bitterness, with the, all these things coming up again and again and again and again. Billions of thoughts in this lifetime. And then billion, countless thoughts in previous lives. So, you know, not under our control. So it's time to rein in this mind, Tsongkhapa is saying, and so that we can take the mind in a more beneficial direction, because where it's leading us now, according to the teachings, again and again, is into the six realms of samsara. For those who are new to this concept, Buddha said there are six realms. Human realm is only one of them. Okay, Animal realm is another one, which we understand and see. Well, we don't understand it, maybe we can see it, so we believe in it. But there are four other realms, at least, with infinite varieties in each of the realms. So hell beings, and threat, hungry ghost beings, and the suffering in those realms. And then there are different levels of God realms, where there are beings with certain kind of powers, uh, but also sufferings. And they're certainly not enlightened. So there are six realms, and these are thought processes, are uncontrolled thoughts, are bad habits of thinking, uh, which create all kinds of verbal and physical wrongdoing as well, which then make us circle all the time in this uh, vicious ocean of samsara, yeah, which is uncontrolled death rebirth, going on and on again and again and again. And we have no control over it because we don't have any control over our minds. No proper control over our minds. 
So what I'm saying is we have huge problems outside, in a sense, and inside, although there's no real barrier. The outside, the world is created by us in our mind. But we have these issues. And how are we dealing with it? We're not dealing with it. Most people are not dealing with it. We have superficial ways of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So, Sankapa in this yellow hat tradition, but also all the other schools of Buddhism, whether Tibetan Buddhism, which of course only started in the 8th century, the Tibetan Buddhism, but uh, basic Buddhism at the time of the Buddha, Buddha was what? He was 5th century BC. Yeah. So from that time onwards, it's been understood that there have to be various processes. There's a certain discipline we have to adopt if we're going to be able to cope with this mind. What's that? It's not just words. We've spoken about words, how they can be very deceptive. And in any case, they're not the thing, the real thing. Even if we were able to describe very carefully a meditative state or something about the dharma or something about a banana or an elephant or, you know, a country, it's not the same at all as experiencing those things, is it? Okay, so what does what do the teachings say we need to have an authentic experience which could actually change us? And not just this endless, you know, uh, flow of uh, apparently wise messages which are assaulting us on our technologies day after day. So the first thing we have to do is to listen. Now that would take a long time actually to talk about because some people, and there's one particular scientist actually, are well, in terms of the current fascination with it, he was also connected with Oppenheimer and worked on these projects. But the David Bohm became a very, very, very environmentally and just very open-minded uh, scientist who had a lot of dialogues with Krishnamurti, whom I quoted from before. And he has written incredible amount on dialogue in the art of listening. But anyway, for our purposes, we could say that listening here, when we talk about listening and the wisdom that can arise through listening, what we mean here is listening to teachings, reading, studying teachings, books, traditionally books. But nowadays, you know, there are some very good things online. So one could read those. One could watch certain videos online. Some lamas are very kind. They know that people, especially some of us younger people, not me, some of us might uh, want something very short. So they even have two, three minute videos. And it's amazing how much you can impart in three minutes, especially if it's from a very marvelous Lama. It's very beneficial. So some Lamas give three minute, four minute videos. That is a part of listening. We shouldn't pretend that will lead us to enlightenment, but it is something we can start with. You might be inspired by one of these short videos to investigate further, to read more, and that would be wonderful. But that is just the first out of three steps, the listening, the reading, the beginning to study, coming to Tushita, going to Tibet house, listening to excellent discourses by the Geshe there, Geshe Lagda. So that is, however, just the first step. We will get some benefit, they say, from doing this, but not much, because the problem with just listening and studying is that similar, if we were to use an analogy, it's like getting the ingredients together to make, uh, well, one example could be chapatis, but we want something more complex, say, I don't know, Christmas cake, uh, maybe in India, not very good example, but for Christmas cake, you need a lot of ingredients flour, 
sugar, dry fruits, spices. Any, anyway, you, you get them all together. You buy them and you bring them to your kitchen and you even open the packets and you put the ingredients there all in different bowls. But then nobody would say that uh, you wouldn't ask someone to eat that. And you wouldn't say to them, there's the Christmas cake, eat it. It's not ready. Right? It's just the ingredients. It's just an example. No example can be perfect. So what do we have to do next, according to the tradition, is to reflect on this, to begin to think about it. You can't just watch something or read something and then just leave it and think that you know it, you know? So for example, if you read the words, this is a good, I think quite a good example. If you read the words, which you will find in Mahayana Buddhist teachings, that your enemy or the person who gives you the most problems is actually your, he is your guru. He is your greatest guru. You must look upon that person as your most, uh, you know, wonderful guru, the person who harms you. And especially yeah, the person you have helped, the person you have helped for many, many years. And what do they do in return? They harm you, okay? So the teachings say, this is your real guru. So what are you to make of that if you just read it? It doesn't make sense. You say, you know, can't accept this. This person really hurt me, you know? How can they be my guru, my teacher? So this leads some analysis, right? One has to understand this. So then you take more teachings or you discuss it and you think about it and it may begin to make some sense, at least logically. You begin to understand the logic of how someone who harms you, only that person can really teach patience. If you want to develop patience, you need such a person. So one begins to understand it a little bit. But so that's like beginning to mix all those ingredients together in a proper way and so forth and put it in a tin ready to put in the oven. But you haven't yet put it in the oven. So it's not quite the Christmas cake yet. But you're getting there. You're much closer. Third thing we have to do after reflecting, analyzing, is to, based on that analysis, some kind of understanding will have arisen, some kind of glimmer of understanding that we have to then meditate on, which means we have to really focus on. This is what is, is said. We have to focus on it. Otherwise, it just still remains like words, like theory. Little, still a little bit too theoretical. It's not yet fully baked. It's not ready. It, it's not yet transforming us. We find it interesting. We find we understand it, whereas initially we didn't even understand it. Now we understand it. But it's not yet enough of a deep understanding to transform the way we look at the world or how we relate to people. Which is why, for example, we say it's not enough to be an expert in breathing meditation so that you can make yourself very calm at Tushita with your breathing meditation. That's not enough. Because at eight o'clock, you have to go out the door and face the world, face the mother, father-in-law, face the rickshaw wala, face the heat, the humidity, uh, the driver doing something wrong or blowing the horn too much. You have to face all these things. So then how are we facing it? How are we coping with the real world? This is where the real test is. Right? So anyway, we have to meditate on that. That the person who harms me after I help them is my guru. And through meditating, having also reasoned first and meditating on it, then we achieve what is called the wisdom or the understanding that arises through meditation which is much, much deeper than the wisdom arising through listening alone. 
you understand what's being said. So you see, with all these WhatsApp messages, with all of this superficial reading that we do, or at least I often do, that's not enough. It's just like you're getting a slight taste, or you're just getting a you're getting you're just beginning to look at the ingredients that are necessary. You haven't put them together properly, and you certainly haven't put them in the oven and baked them properly. So there's no digestible, lovely Christmas cake there, which you can benefit from. You have to bake it and do it properly. So uh, Tibetan Buddhism mentions this a lot. Analytical meditation, which is has to be done through this process. If you take other forms of meditation, where we're just trying to um, <clears throat> develop stability of mind, even there, you have to first listen to the teachings, the instructions on how to develop that state of mind. You have to reflect on it, and then begin to really meditate. In solitude is how it's done, those particular practices. Or oh, many months on end before one can really develop some deeper understanding, deeper realization. Yeah. Take the meditation on death, which is supposed to be a very important one, which helps us stop wasting time, you know, realizing we're going to die. So death is certain. We don't want, know when we're going to die. And the teachings keep on telling us only spiritual effort, spiritual understanding, courage, inner understanding is going to help us at the moment of death, before we die. So then, okay, we heard that, but then we have to really reflect on it and meditate on it so that we can get to the level of the yogis and yoginis who don't waste even one hour of their life because they have this deep realization of impermanence and death. They realize at some deep level, which is very hard for someone like me to understand. Because for me, it's just words. But for them, it's real. It's like they're not going to waste an hour or even a minute because for them, it's real. Death and impermanence is real. It could happen any time. They're not going to waste any time. So you see the power of the practice if it's done properly and how difficult it is. But one thing, one teaching I did want to mention, because the day before I spoke a lot about how the Dharma is like an insult. It insults us. It torpedoes our complacency. Of course, death awareness does that. But also one of the teachings of the Buddha that I find uh, quite distressing, it's quite upsetting, <laughs> it certainly doesn't make one feel comfortable, is the Buddha's teaching on suffering. Now, it's okay. We know we suffer. When I have a headache, I know I'm suffering. When I'm having anxiety, not getting what I want, I know it's suffering. But what does the Buddha say? He goes further than that. He says, for us ordinary people, for us uninstructed worldlings, this one expression they use, translation in the Pali, uh, uninstructed worldlings like myself, we think that pleasure is happiness. You know, watching you know, something on, on Netflix is, is, is pleasure, is happiness. But this is no, it's just another form of suffering. It's just another, what he calls, suffering of change. You start watching the show on Netflix because you're bored or unhappy or some unpleasant feeling has come up and you want to, you know, before it takes hold, you want to distract your mind and make yourself happy. So, you start watching something and it's fascinating. And before you know it, you're on season three, you know. Before you know it, you already watch 10 episodes. Um, and you feel, wow, this is great. What a great actor. What a great script. You know, even though there's a lot of swearing and so forth, and think, wow, that's great, you know. Um, but this is suffering. According to Buddha, this is not happiness. You have not created even in this moment, happiness, and you're certainly not creating the cause for future happiness by indulging in this. With our ordinary state of mind, if one were watching it with tremendous awareness, wisdom, compassion, that's another matter. 
but that's quite difficult to do. So it's suffering. So again, sex, drugs, rock and roll, football, uh, custard, uh, gaja kahalwa, all these things that one loves, they're just suffering of change. Because, why? Because they appear happiness and pleasure because they are taking the place of uh, a mood or a situation which was unpleasant. So they appear very pleasant and great, but they change because they cannot keep on giving you happiness. Even you play your favorite song again and again, how long can you do it before you have to stop? You do have to stop at some point, you know. After a hundred, you know, replays, it does get a bit too much or boring. Even though when you first listen to it, you might have thought, this is wow, this is the greatest song. You know, how come I didn't know about this song? How come I'm discovering it after 20 years or whatever? But how long can you listen to it before it becomes suffering? How much can you eat of your favorite food before it becomes painful? or at least much less interesting. So anyway, that's one way to look at it. But the Buddha is also saying that basically we are Buddha. We are primordially good, as I mentioned at the beginning, remember, an hour ago. And, but what do we do? We fill all this space, beautiful spaciousness of the mind, the goodness, the warmth, potential of our mind. We fill it with garbage, you know, because of the ignorance and the grasping and so forth in our mind. And, and we label some of it pleasure or happiness. It, it's ridiculous, it's not, it's suffering. So basically our life is suffering. Even our attempt to give, get rid of what we, we call suffering, even that attempt, which we call happiness sometimes, Buddha says, sorry, this is also suffering. Dukkha which is a constriction of the spaciousness of the mind into something that is inauthentic, cannot give us lasting happiness. Lord Maitreya, whose statue is behind me, of course, it's just a statue. It's not Lord, him, Lord Maitreya himself, although it could be, I don't know, maybe he's in there somewhere. But Lord Maitreya has a quote where he says, just as excrement lacks a sweet taste, so samsara lacks happiness. How about that? For a very graphic quote from Lord Maitreya, <laughs> who's the future Buddha. He's the future Buddha. And as a great being, Bodhisattva already is giving these teachings to Asanga and others. He's saying, just as excrement lacks a sweet flavor, so samsara lacks happiness. You know? Goodness me. If this isn't bad news, what, you know, what else is bad news? This is the worst news. <clears throat> Saying everything, basically, the suffering is suffering, but also the happiness is suffering. <laughs> Someone comes in for the casualty department, you sew them up, you fix them, you make them able to go out onto Orbindo Marg again, they're still suffering. Of course, it is still suffering. They go out into the heat and this and back to their, their little lives with their problems, anxieties. Where is an end of it? And then according to Buddha, you die. And you get reborn according to a karma. And if most of our karma is very ordinary, negative, then that's the life we're going to have in the future. And it goes on and on and on, beginninglessly, endlessly. So it's not very good news, folks. But the good news is that this is all temporary. If we were to make the real effort beyond our WhatsApp messaging to, uh, you know, actually listen, reflect, and meditate authentically. Of course, people like Krishnamurti say, get rid of gurus, ignore gurus, books, you don't need it. He's, act, he's speaking from a very high level of experience. As uh, Sambhang Rinpoche, the great Tibetan Lama, explained to us, he said, don't worry, Krishnamurti, yeah, he's talking from, he's coming from above, but most of us are below, so we have to start from below. With words, with paths, with meditations of a certain kind, we have to do all this conceptually. 
using thinking, a lot of thinking also. Krishnamurti has gone beyond all that, so he's giving us a taste of what it's like to come from a higher level, approach the subject from on high, if you like. We have to start at the bottom, where we are. Krishnamurti already in, in space, if you like. Hmm. So there's work to be done. So we mustn't forget this. So what's the job of the guru? The guru's job is when we forget, <laughs> when we forget these things, the guru's job, according to another modern lama, well, a modern sage, the Tibetan tradition, says we follow a spiritual, okay, for someone serious, okay, for someone serious, and according to this, they're very few serious people. For someone serious about following a spiritual path, there's no substitute for being guided by a guru. Why? We follow a spiritual path because we want to defeat our emotions and attain enlightenment. Okay? To achieve that goal, we need discipline, guidance, and the courage to confront everything we have spent many lifetimes trying to avoid. <laughs> this is precisely what a guru provides us with. By challenging our preconceived concepts, disrupting our lives, and most important of all, by denying egos every wish. So if you have a guru who is just making you feel good all the time, and kind of smiling at you every time you see them and uh, flattering you and praising you, then maybe you found the wrong guru. Or you are very new and he's not yet softening you up. He's just, he's just enticing you into his enlightened space so that he can begin to clobber your ego later. Often, of course, you know, if you have a guru, they can't start abusing you the first day, right? You, you, you'll run away. But if you have developed some trust in someone, then they can start dismantling your ego, which is their job. Why is it their job? Because our ego is our main obstacle to happiness and enlightenment. So of course the guru is going to dismantle our ego. Is it painful? Yes, it is painful. Of course it's painful. The ego will shriek and shout and so forth because ego which is basically selfish and caught up in hope and fear and expectations and jealousy and greed and miserliness and violence of course it's going to scream and shout when someone is not doing what the ego thinks is wants you know but the ego is based on ignorance you know and the guru as we know from our hindu tradition is the bringer of light guru is someone who brings you from darkness to light Ego is the embodiment of, you could say, darkness. So, of course, it's going to scream and shout when the Guru starts dragging it into the light, you know, destroying it. So, and there, after that quote, Zon Sarimpache says, so therefore, be very careful when you choose a Guru. Make sure you have an authentic Guru. Of course, the danger is that always the danger that we might not be ready yet for the authentic guru. So the authentic guru is going to destroy our ego one way or another. That's because it's their job. So if they're doing their job properly, they'll be trying to do that in some way by forceful methods, indirect methods, subtle methods, depending on the student. Okay, so uh, the summary, we're in trouble. And, and I'll go into some more of this Sunday morning, if I can uh, pull myself away from the distractions of Goa, where my brother is holidaying with his wife and children. So if I can stay away from the swimming pool at the hotel, then we'll have the session. I'll try to remember. I'm sure Nidita will send me a message to remember the session. Don't worry, won't forget the session. I'll make sure I'm somewhere where there's good uh, Wi-Fi. <clears throat> Maybe my brother's hotel room, we'll see. 
So anyway, um, but for now we need to realize and we need to think about that quote I gave at the beginning. Maybe I should give it again. So you remember that it wasn't just a dream that you that I uh, said this. It actually happened if somebody said this, which maybe we know, but people don't like to say it. You won't hear it on um, you know Independence Day speeches or any other speeches for that matter. You won't hear what Krishna Murthy is saying. You will not get the truth from the normal. Uh, pulpits, you know, the sermons, the speeches we hear in this world are mostly not connected with the truth. <laughs> uh, we have built a society which is violent, and we as human beings are violent. The environment, the culture in which we live is the product of our endeavor, of our struggle, of our pain of our appalling brutalities. So the most important question is, is it possible to end this tremendous violence in oneself? You know, before we go trying to cure it in other people, the violence starts in here, in our minds. And we can't just say, oh, it's just in their minds, you know, in the politicians' minds. No, it's in all of our minds certain degrees of violence. And the violence of duality, even maybe some yogis would say, that's a violence. So there's all this sense of duality all the time. Me and other. Solid me, solid other. That's of course going to create problems. But that's a kind of violence against the truth. The, well, the truth of non-duality. So I say to myself, I want to live a really peaceful life in which there is a deep abundance of love. All the violence must go. Now, what have I to do? So this is, uh, well, I'll leave it for today. Be very disciplined today. Um, this is, we'll continue with this theme on Sunday and then uh, Nidita will uh, moderate some sessions on Monday and Tuesday evenings where questions arising can be looked at. And so if some of you are interested in what has been said, my sources were Beyond Violence by Krishnamurti, um, Eric Fromm, from F-R-O-M-M, -M, The Art of Loving, and Zongsa Jamyang Chense, Zongsa Rinpoche's uh, book, very aptly titled, Not for Happiness. What a book for a Buddhist, not for happiness. So, of course, it's when we learn properly what he means, then we might be open to real happiness. And I didn't get to quote from Skillful Means. I will do that on Sunday. Skillful Means is a book by Tartan Tulku, who is one of the first Tibetan Buddhist teachers to really bring out a lot of publications and who has since done tremendous, unbelievable positive work for the Dharma, uh, especially with organizing prayer festivals and uh, publication of authentic uh, Dharma literature. Millions and millions of copies. Okay, so I'm not going to take questions today because uh, Sometimes it's good to leave things to percolate in the mind. And there's some old friends here, so I want to just talk with them off screen. But thank you very much, everybody on screen. And um, I hope it was a little bit useful. Um, so Neeraj Ji, oh, I'm seeing, thank you, and Pradeep Ji and all the other good people. Thank you very, very much. Um, and hope to see some of you Sunday morning at 11. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat>